Hello, I'm Rob Pometier. I'm one of the co-authors of the textbook Marketing Strategy Based on First Principles and Data Analytics. In this session, we're going to go through Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is focused on Market Principle 3, which is the idea that all competitors react. And if all competitors react, you need to manage your sustainable competitive advantage to build a barrier around your business. The agenda for today's session, I'm going to through a little bit of introduction and outline why we think this is one of the first principles. Then I'm going to go through the approaches and frameworks for managing sustainable competitive advantage. First is an evolution over time on what was, what did firms use as the biggest barriers for protecting their business over the last 50, 100 years, if you will. Then we're going to go through a customer equity perspective. This is a customer-centric way to account for the value and how strong your barriers is in your business, your barriers are for your business. Financial accounting doesn't nat naturally capture it, so we're going to use another accounting system and as a co customer equity perspective. Then I'm going to go through another analysis technique or another uh, research approach called customer experiments. Experiments are very good for figuring out different aspects of your business, and we're going to give it a demonstration within the customer equity perspective. Finally, I'm going to go through the framework for managing competitive advantage. Okay, all competitors react. All firms are out there putting in effort, time, resources, money to copy and to innovate, to come out with a way to better service customers. Very often, those customers that go after will be the same customers you're trying to protect. This idea that they're all out there going after your customers, if you will, is this, is this third principle. Especially if you do the first two principles right, let's say you're very good at identifying your target segment, you know how your customers migrate in your portfolio, you're starting to make high, you know your CLVs, you're making lots of sales and profits. I guarantee you, the bigger the sales and profits, the more the competitors are going to come after your business. Why? Because they see it as a good opportunity. So as these competitors react, you need a way to protect your business. The way we're going to protect our business is by building sustainable competitive advantage. That's just the term we use. That's the term we use for the barriers or the moat around our business. And you're going to see in many cases, you want to do both. You want to build walls around your business, and you also want to build a moat around your business. And that's going to protect you from competitors. Because guaranteed, if you're doing successful, competitors are going to come after you. So what are the requirements for an SCA? We'll go through those. Of the four first principles, though, probably the most difficult of the four is building sustainable competitive advantage. The first two principles, all customers differ, so you have to manage heterogeneity. All customers change, so you have to manage customer dynamics. Those principles are pretty straightforward. You can go execute them. This one, though, is very tough because you have very smart people at your competitors trying to do the same thing you're doing, trying to innovate, trying to build relationships, trying to build brands, trying to come after your customers. So we're going to spend, actually, the next three sessions after this one on this first principle on how to build a barrier around our business. I think this is a, um, building an SCA is key since all competitors react, but I think this Sun Tzu statement captures it. Let's look at this. The art of war teaches, and so they wrote this, this is before Christ, Sun Tzu, ancient China. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. So the idea here is, we know competitors are going to attack. We can't just guess that they're not going to come. We know they're going to attack. Because we know they're going to attack, we have to make our position unassailable. And that's what we're trying to do with SCAs. Okay, a firm has an SCA when it's able to generate more customer value than competitor firms in an industry with the same set of products. A good SCA must meet three criteria. Customers must care about it. The firm has to do it better than competitors, which generates a relative advantage. And third, it must be hard to duplicate or substitute. If you don't, let's say you do the first two, the customers care, 
you build a relative advantage, but if customers can copy you, excuse me, if your competitors can copy you, they'll just do the exact same thing you're doing it. Maybe at a little lower price. Maybe they have a lower labor rate. They're doing a me proof product and they manufacture offshore. So it has to be hard to duplicate. Very often this hard to duplicate is the most difficult part of an SCA. So what we're learning is thus being first with a new idea is not sufficient to create a barrier. There was one study that showed out of all the new innovations, 10 years later only 11% of those new markets were being led. The market share leader was by the person who invented the new technology. Very often being first is not enough because people can just copy you. So often to make, a hard, to make an SCA hard to copy, firms turn to market-based sources of SCA. There are other sources. We're going to focus, being in a market of strategy, we're going to focus on market-based sources. And there's really three major market-based sources of SCA. The first is brands. You build really strong brands. If you think of a company like Coca-Cola, they have a very strong brand. It's not hard to knock off Coca-Cola because of the recipe. It's hard to knock off Coca-Cola because of the brand. The second way is offerings. You can just have better products. For a long time, Intel microprocessors were the best product in the market. And they were competing just on offering. But after a while, they came to understand that offering wasn't enough. So they did the Intel Inside campaign to build a brand around their microprocessor. So then they had offering, plus they had brand as a sustainable competitive advantage. Third is relationships. Relationships are typically better in services, like with your hairdresser, your doctor, um, or in large B2B firms where it's very cost effective to develop a relationship. You don't use it in consumer goods. In consumer goods, you often use brands. Why? Because there's so many consumers out there, it's too hard to develop an individual relationship with each one of them. So overall, the three sources of Sustainable competitive advantage, brands, offering, relationship. We give it an acronym we call BOR. Brand, offering, relationship. This is where we spend most of our money in marketing, building brands, offering, and relationship. But recognize, good firms don't just use one of these as a sustainable competitive advantage. They bundle multiple components. Let's look at the example of Starbucks. What do you think Starbucks' sustainable competitive advantage is? It has a high quality brand valued at five, over five billion dollars. Some people are very emotionally attached to that Starbucks cup in their hand. They do it every morning. They have a distinct offering of coffee drinks and store environments. They spend a lot of effort to make that store environment friendly. They hire good employees and pay them decent with medical and dental and um, retirement plans. Why? Because they want those customers those employees to be loyal, good at customer service, and build relationships with their customers. So they use brands and relationships and offerings. These three sources go together and make it very hard for somebody to knock off Starbucks. They're continuing to innovate. Tavana Tea Products is a brand new product they're doing. So they're going to have another new product coming out. And they're adding technology-based services like mobile phone payment. All of these together makes brand offering relationship. That's the barrier for some other company to come out and start competing with Starbucks. This is an overall grid that goes through each of the three market-based assets as a source of competitive advantage. It talks the barriers to duplication. Brand image resides in the consumer's mind, hard to copy. Sometimes products have performance benefits or patents, relationships lead to trust and commitment. We look at where it's most effective, consumer, business, relationships or business to business, these are both. And then we give a few examples of firms that do this. Okay, so overall, our premise is competitive reaction, that competitors react is a fundamental assumption of marketing strategy. Competitors can displace firms in many different ways. Let's think of some of the ways. They can come out with a new technical innovation. They can exploit changes in customers' desire due to culture environment. Maybe all of a sudden people are getting more sensitive to diamonds, blood diamonds, and so diamonds that aren't from certain parts of the world would maybe be seen as more positive. 
Individual entrepreneurship. How many new tech businesses have been started in garages and expand to become multi-billion dollar businesses? Me do copycat, somebody that just takes your idea and manufactures it in a cheaper location. Thus, managers need to anticipate these actions and build competitive advantage, sustainable competitive advantage. So market principle three is that all competitors react and effective marketing strategies must manage sustainable competitive advantage. So in essence, we know competitors are coming after us. We need to understand how to build it. So what we're going to turn to next are the approaches for managing sustainable competitive advantage. Let's look at the evolution over time. If we go to the pre-industrial age, kind of let's look at we're in England thousands of years ago. What, how was things working? How was exchange working? Marketing, if you will. What was happening was this. A farmer would grow the produce. They would bring it into the town and maybe sell it to the local little shopkeeper. They had a personal relationship. The shopkeeper would sell it to other people in the town. There might be a blacksmith manufacturing. Probably 80 or 90% of what was being done was being manufactured in that own little village. If somebody had bad product, if one of the farmers had rotten vegetables, how quick would everybody know about that? They did not give out bad product because they had to maintain their trusting relationship with the shopkeeper and everyone involved. So interpersonal relationships was really the whole SCA when firms first started in the pre-industrial age, these little small businesses. But then we went into the industrial revolution. Mass production started. What did this cause? Factories were producing large amount of goods and they had to distribute them over a large area. So because they were distributing, no longer did they know the person they were selling to or buying from. So relationship had to be, maybe it became lesser important. Brands became important. All the original brands were just people's name. They were just extending their relationship. If you look at Ferrari, JCPenney, Gillette, these were companies that originally had relationships with their customers, but then they grew so big, they turned their name into a brand of their business and say, hey, we'll stand behind our brand. So brands became really important in the industrial revolution. Third, in the technology revolution, there was all sorts of new digital and knowledge economy. A lot of that came from digital electronics and such. And when that happened, offerings became big. You look at phones and computers and all sorts of electronics good. In this case, very often innovation is generated. If you look at the two companies with some of the highest valuations in the world, Apple and Google, they weren't even in existence. They expanded with the new technology and grew very, very quick. So product technology. Interesting, Apple and Coke preceded, exceeded Coke. Coke's value came from the brand, but Google and Apple came from their offering. Now people are arguing, so we have brand offering relationships. Some people are arguing that relationship is coming back to be important. Why is relationships coming more important? Let me give you an example of a firm on as they shift to services. Right now, 85% of the US economy is services, as judged by the US government. They rate every firm as a product or service firm. That number has increased by 30 or 40% over the last couple decades. Why has that happened? Prices of services are going up, prices of products are going down. People are buying more services and selling more services. Services require more of a relationship to deliver because they're intangible and they're hard to evaluate. And you want to have a relationship with your service provider to manage that risk. But this is even becoming as part of a strategy. GE did it, Emerson Electric did it. Let me give you an example of how it worked with Emerson Electric. Emerson Electric, a Fortune 100 firm with 61 business units, one of their business units made refrigeration equipment. This would be the kind of equipment you would find in a grocery store with the lettuce, maybe another one with meat and produce in it and, and um, dairy products. They used to sell those and uh, what happened is an international firm from China actually made this product, metal, plastic, a few moving parts. They were able to manufacture high quality refrigeration equipment at about 30 or, and sell it 30 or 40 percent less than Emerson. So Emerson, you know, obviously that damaged their business a lot because competitors reacted. So then Emerson had to react. What they came to realize is that 
Grocery stores didn't really care about refrigeration equipment. They just want, they're into the business of selling groceries. So they went to him and said, this is what we'll do. They said, we'll come and buy all your refrigeration equipment from you. We'll lease it to you. And there's actually some financial advantages for the grocery store to do that. And we'll also do this. We will maintain it. If it ever fails, we will warranty any spoilage you have because our equipment fails. We'll maintain it so the temperature is at the right bands and if there's water spraying on the vegetables, we'll maintain that. And then we'll upcape it. We'll remove it and put new ones in at some frequency of three to four years that we think is appropriate. Would you like this service contract? The same way Otis Elevator. They barely make money on the elevator. In some cases, they lose it and they make money on the maintenance agreement. So Emerson Electric ended up shifting from being into the business of selling refrigeration equipment to providing the whole service of refrigeration. They were successful in doing that. Now, can this firm that used to, that came in, this Me Too copycat selling refrigeration equipment, can they come from, let's say, China to sell into this market? No, they can't. Why? Because they don't have the relationships with all these people. People aren't willing to buy the service agreement from somebody in another continent. So in this case, they made the, they rebundled what they're selling and their SCA is becoming more of the relationships and the trust with the firm rather than just the product. And that's the reason why relationships are coming back in is because the economy in the US is becoming so large of a service economy today and relationships are more important in services. But you can see overall, we're arguing today all three sources of sustainable competitive advantage are important. Okay, so if now if I said there's three ways we can build SCA, but one problem we have is accounting metrics. If you look at the balance sheet of a firm, let me give an example. Intel. When Intel wants to build a new fab, that's what they call a manufacturing plant for microprocessors, when they want to build a new fab, it might cost a billion dollars. When they spend that billion dollars to build this asset, it goes onto the balance sheet. And then every year it might depreciate a little bit. But that million dollars is not considered expense in that year's profit and loss. It's an asset. They bought an asset, so the money, those, that cash goes to an asset. However, when Intel Inside, or when Intel spent nearly a billion dollars on the campaign, the marketing campaign of Intel Inside, how did the accountants treat that billion dollars? They don't treat that as an asset. What they treat it as is this. Every year when you spend a dollar on marketing, it has to be expensed as in that year. So even after you spend a billion dollars on the manufacturing plant, they get to show that money as an asset being depreciated. They spend a billion dollars on marketing. It's treated as a complete expense as if at the end of the year it's gone. But guess what? Intel Inside was one of the most successful campaigns in the B2B world ever. What they did is Intel was finding out that there was only four or five large manufacturers in the world that were buying their microprocessors. Companies like Dell, HP, maybe IBM, Lenovo in the back in the past. And when they were buying, when there's only five buyers, they were beating them up on price and AMD was a competitor and sometimes AMD's product was good enough. So Dell computer, for instance, would say, hey, if you charge me this high price, I'm gonna buy them from AMD and put them in my, com in my computers I sell. Intel didn't want that to happen. So they wanted to stop just competing on the offering and they wanted to add another source of sustainable competitive advantage. By putting the sticker on the computer, so what they did is they paid a co-op marketing budget to put a sticker on every computer called Intel Inside. And they did some advertising campaigns and such. By doing that, they made consumers aware of what kind of microprocessors is in the computer. And they added some prestige and status. So now people would say, geez, I don't really know what a microprocessor does, but I know I want the Intel Inside because I perceive that as being better. Once they were able to do that, they were able to reduce the pressure from Dell saying, hey, I'm gonna to switch to AMD. AMD couldn't switch to, or Dell couldn't switch to AMD because consumers were wanting to have Intel inside. So that was a very good way to build sustainable competitive advantage. But the thing I wanna bring up is that the money being spent is considered an expense and the asset you're building, that awareness, 
That brand image is not tracked anywhere in the accounting reports. So the accountants, you could have two firms here, one with a strong brand, one without a strong brand, and there's no way on the balance sheet of an accounting firm of uh, accounting statement can you see that. So marketers have come up with a way to track that. We call it customer equity. Customer equity is how we track the assets associated with these SCAs. The premise is customers are considered a financial asset which should be measured, managed, and maximized. Treat customer just like any other asset, even though the accounting don't treat customers or customers' brands or such as an asset. Customer equity is not captured on a balance sheet. Spending on building equity, brands, relationship, is treated as an expense. So why do we want to bother with customer-centric accounting, this customer equity measure? Because in many cases, Coca-Cola, for example, the brand is the number one driver, is their number one SCA, and is their number one driver of sales and product. Oh, I'll have a Coke. However, the firm is not capturing that in their balance sheet. That brand value doesn't show up, so we need to capture it. Also, these equities are the primary sources of SCA, so we should be able to see it. And it also captures the long-term impact of marketing action. When you spend, like the Intel Inside example shows, when they build a marketing campaign like that, it doesn't end at the end of the year. Those brands are good for multiple years. So we want it to be able to last past a year. So we come up with this technique, and I'm going to give it with an example. We call it the customer equity perspective or the equity stack. So let's go build it. This is the total value to the customer is captured in this stack. And I'm going to do it in an example of a beer. First, I'm going to start with an offering. Offering is equity is defined as the core benefits relative to the cost of an offering. Offering equity, let's think of it in a beer example. If I took a, a, a bottle of beer and I put it in a paper sack and I asked, did you, I asked you to taste it. You tasted it. And then I said, how much would you pay for that? You don't know the brand, you'd say, I'd pay $5 for that beer, it tastes pretty good. So the offering equity with price, performance, that's it, five bucks. But let's say now I wanna add to that offering equity, brand equity. Brand equity is the set of brand assets and liabilities linked to the brand name, assets, symbols, or subtract from the value. Brand equity, in the beer example, would be if I took the bag off the beer, and say, oh, that's my favorite brand. Let's say it's a Heineken. You say, geez, I really like Heineken. I say, how much will you pay for it? You say, well, I typically pay $8 for a Heineken. The extra $3 on top of the $5 is the brand equity. That's how much extra you'll pay besides just the product. And you say, well, do people really pay for that? Yes. Look at Tiffany jewelry. You can buy the same diamond at a store down the street for half the price. That extra price is to get it in the turquoise bag because we know brand is worth something. Why is it worth something? If you bring home a jewelry and it's in that turquoise bag and people say, wow, that's a Tiffany, that means something to the person receiving it. Now the last one we're going to do is relational equity. In our beer example, how much would you pay for that beer if it was delivered by your favorite bartender? So $5 was just what the beer was worth. $8, the extra three was the brand equity. The extra on top of that, maybe you'll spend $12 for the beer if it's served by your favorite bartender. Why? Because you have a relationship with that bartender. You could buy the beer at, the, um, at a bar down the street for cheaper, but then you don't get to talk to your bartender. So you're willing to pay $12. The eight to 12, that extra $4, that's the relational equity. We stack those three together. All together, the beer gives you $12. There might be another example of a beer over here that only give you, it only costs $4 for the beer. Maybe the offering isn't as good. There is a bad brand and bad relationship or no relationship. All those stacked together is kind of how we measure the value of your SCA. Just like you'd measure the value of a, a factory on the accounting statement on the balance sheet, we look at customer equity as a way to capture. Realize brand equity isn't always positive. There's a good example with Hyundai automobiles. Hyundai's been working a lot of times to improve their product of their, their offering to make the cars more um, look better, 
to make them last longer, give a good warranty. But they have a problem when they compete against Toyota. And here's kind of a famous study. They take a car, they strip all the symbols off so you can't tell if it's a Toyota or a Hyundai. And they go to consumers and they say, how much will you pay for this car? It gives the gas mileage, they let them look at it, blah, blah, blah. And people say, I'll pay you $20,000 for that car. You say, oh, okay, so that's the offering. They say, well, what if I make it, oh, guess what, this is a Toyota, how much will you pay? You say, I'll pay you $25,000 for that car if it's a Toyota. Same exact attributes, but the brand equity, because they think they make reliable cars, et cetera, they get $25,000, that would be the brand equity. They say, what if it's a Hyundai? They say, I'll pay you $18,000. You'll pay less than not knowing the brand. It has a negative brand equity. Why is that? Because Hyundai's got associated for cars being cheaper. Walmart is another company that has fairly low brand equity. So brand doesn't have to be always positive. It typically is because you spend a lot of money to make it positive, but in some cases it can be negative. These three stack together, we call the equity stack. There's a multiple arguments for why you wanna use an equity stack in order to understand your sustainable competitive advantage. One, bore equities are often the primary source of your SCA. It allows firm to make better decisions. If I'm spending money building a brand, I need to know how much value I'm generating. Think of an example, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble have brand managers of like Tide Soap. Let's say you're a brand manager of Tide Soap and you're paid a bonus at the end of each year on how much money you make. Seems reasonable. But if you know you're gonna leave the job next year, you might slow down advertising this year because you know if you don't spend money on advertising, it'll show having higher profits in this year. Because if you're gonna spend a million dollars in advertising, you don't spend it, that shows right down in the bottom line a profit. So then you're gonna get a bigger bonus. But the brand drop, it probably will cause your brand equity to go down. But that's not going to affect things till next year or the year after. So if you don't measure it, people might make suboptimal decisions. So typically firms like Procter & Gamble, they measure the brand equity. There's firms out there, BAV for example, Interbrand, they're out there measuring brand equity of different firms. Um, it allows you to make optimal decisions. Effective customer equity systems represent actually an SCA in their own right. Procter & Gamble got good at understanding what their brand equity is, so they're better able to spend advertising dollars. Many firms' SEA results from bore investments, but there are other sources. In marketing, this is marketing strategy, we're gonna focus on brands offering relationship, but there is other things that firms do. That's just not the focus of, of ours. I wanted to bring that up to say this isn't the only way. Even though in many cases, they're finding them the hardest to duplicate. So, very often we use experiments. We use experiments as a method and it can help us determine equity and how much equity we're building. For example, we might wanna do an advertisement and we wanna know how much, um, let's say we're gonna launch a new product. Maybe Procter & Gamble is offering um, a new product called the Swiffer. If we wanna know how much brand equity we wanna build, we could go and how much advertising to spend, we could do a study in two cities that are very similar to each other. And one, we launched a product and we put, you know, five million of advertising. The other city, we launch a product, we do one million of advertising. We compare the difference over time. It gives us insight into how much brand equity you want to build. I'm going to give you an example using an experiment and what are some of the benefits of it. The good things about experiments is they test causality. In other words, if I randomly put things in two groups and one of them I do something and the other I don't, and then I look at the different outcome, I can attribute the outcome to the, the, the treatment or the experiment. We often use it after we find something, we have an idea and we want to confirm it's going to work. So it's often our, our way to test things. The process is you randomly divide customers into two groups. You do nothing to one group, it's a control group. You do your treatment or your condition to other groups, and it can be more than one. And, but you don't even let the, uh, often you don't even want the employees to know. Just like when you do medical research called double blind. Not only do you give the, custom, the medical, the patient, a placebo, you also don't tell the doctor which one's getting the placebo and the real pill so that there's nothing else that could confound the experiment. 
After a period of time, you test the difference in the outcomes and see what happened. And we go through this in more detail in 4.1. But here's just a really simple example. You want to get people to buy supplementary items when they're buying an airline ticket. Let's say you have, you're selling airline tickets online. And so when you're selling the airline tickets, you can sell some hotels, rental cars, and other stuff on the site. You have an existing ad, but your boss wants you to use a new swimsuit ad. You take, you take some time, you design a new experiment. We want to have a random assignment of customers, and we're going to compare these. We want to make sure there's nothing else different. We, want, we don't want to run one experiment on one time a day, another in a different time of day. Typically what we do, we might even alternate. We run one, the next customer gets the other ad, and we compare these two ads. Let's see how they work. Here's the results. This is how many, the ad we're using now, this is how many extra dollars they spent on average. Here it is with the new swimsuit ad. And this is all done in Excel. We compare the average or the mean. So, wow, we made $231 more on the swimsuit ad. We also may look at the median and the standard deviation. But is this 231 statistically significant? You can do a simple t-test using Excel and you find the probability this was random was um, only 4%. Typically we use 5% as a cutoff, so we say this is a meaningful difference, this $231. So typically when we run an experiment, we always want to see is the difference random or what's the probability the difference was random. If you just toss a coin twice and you get a heads and tails, or let's say you get two tails in a row, you want to check if that's significant. Um, you have to run a larger number of samples. If you run it 100 times, you'll see that it'll balance out at about 50-50, 50, 50, 50 heads, 50 tails. If you only do it twice or three times, you could get heads, heads, heads. And you say, wow, that's, this coin must always give heads. No, you got to go long enough so it balances out. This Statistical test allows you to understand if you've gone long enough based on that big a sample, that amount of change is at random. Typically, we use experiments very often to test how our marketing treatments are work, our bore strategies. And all this can come from Excel, very simple way. But sometimes you can't randomly assign things. For example, let's say you wanted to understand CEO, how important was a CEO to a company? You can't randomly assign CEOs to companies and do an experiment. So in these, you often do natural experiments. They're not as strong a test of causality, but here would be an example of one. Let's say a competitor entered your market and started coming directly against your product with a head-to-head -head competition. And you had three sales regions, and each sales region did something different. One matched price of the new competitor, another held price confident, constant, the third just gave free shipping. If you had that happen, let's say for a year after this competitor entered with a cheaper price, you could go back and test and say what strategy worked the best. You didn't randomly assign these three conditions. That's what people actually did in the market. You're just going to see the results. Very often, though, you have to um, control for other things that might cause a difference. Brand strength in those different territories, the type of product sold, the size of customers. And what we do on these is we control for these other variables, these other covariates. And then we can look at what strategy worked better. So this is how we would do a natural experiment. So experiments are a very powerful tool we want to use to test which of our bore strategies work the best for building sustainable competitive advantage. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the framework for managing SCAs, competitive advantage. What are the inputs? Well, you notice the inputs are just the outputs of the previous two market principles. You have to do the first steps right. You have to segment your customers, figure out which target you're going after, and how you're going to position. You also then, after you do that, you manage customer dynamics by segmenting your own customer portfolio into acquisition, expansion, or retention groups, and finding the personas. And then you come up with the positioning strategies for those personas. So the, tar the overall positioning is for the whole market, and then you have air positioning statements for each persona. And then you look at air strategies. What strategies work the best for acquisition, expansion, recension across the different personas, if you remember that 
air strategy grid. You also have to look at future trends because these things might impact your SCA. If you see there's a trend for environmental sustainability, you better start making your, your cars more energy efficient. And some of these take a long time to do, so you want to look at these trends. What are the approaches and processes? One is the BOR, or the Brand Offering Relationship Equity Stack. We have the AIR strategy and the BOR equity grid that I'm going to go through here just in a minute. And then what we're going to spend the next three sessions on is really brand and relationship and innovation processes. How do you really do brand management, relationship management, R&D management? Here's some of the analysis, field experiment, conjoints, multivariate, and choice models. And some of these we'll talk in later sessions. So what is the output of this? You get what your existing SCA is and what your future SCA. How are you going to compete in the future? You're also going to come out with your strategy for brand. So if you're Starbucks, what is your branding strategy? What is your offering strategy? What is your relationship strategy? How are these going to work together to build your SCA? And this is where we're going to spend the next three sessions. OK, um, I want to go through on how these two grids fit together. The air strategy grid we talked about earlier in the uh, market principle two. We have each of these personas across the three stages. The personas capture different customer heterogeneity. We know that in our own customer portfolio, customers can be different. So we give them a different persona name. We treat customers differently across acquisition, expansion, and retention, and that captures customer dynamics, which is market principle two. This feeds into the Bohr equity grid. The Bohr equity grid talks about what is our marketing objective for brands, offering, and relationship. How does it offer a relative advantage? These relative advantages are going to come, how are we competing up here? And how are we going to have sustainability? We also feed in these environmental trends. If we have this completed, that tells us how to go spend our money in brands, offering, and relationships. That's our roadmap for spending money. It comes out of the air gravity, the air strategy grid, and environmental trends. Okay, so the process for managing SCA. The first step is to complete your air strategy grid, and you'll do that really in market principle two. What are your personas? What is your strategy in each of the three stages of acquisition, expansion, and retention? Then you look at what are the key trends. You pull that information in. Those two feed into the bore equity grid. You complete it to describe your marketing objective, your relative advantage, your source of sustainability, what you want to achieve from brand offering and relationships. There's actually a natural sequence across these. Typically, a firm comes up with their brand strategy first. Why? Brand comes right out of the overall firm's positioning strategy. And brands are very hard to change. We'll talk about this more next time, but very hard to change. So if you're going to be a Tiffany with a high-end brand, or you're going to be a BMW with a high-end brand, you can't all of a sudden change that and say, oh, next week I'm going to be a low-end supplier. That brand takes many years, if not decades, to build, and it has to be consistent. So the first thing you come out with your brand decisions. Then you develop offerings to support your brand. If your brand is BMW and you want to have the ultimate driving machine, you need to come up with offerings that fit that market position, that branding ar argument. After you do offering, then relationships are typically last. Why are they last? Relationships come into play typically when you're delivering your product. That kind of happens last. It's tied into your overall strategy, but it's usually done last. So like now, when you go buy a BMW, they want you to understand all their new technology, like the iDrive. So they force the salespeople, they're required to sit in the car with you and program your phone, show you how it works, put your home number, your work number, get it all working because there's so much technology they've embedded in it. They're worried that people won't understand it. They really work to build that relationship with the salesperson and the dealership and the customer. They give you a lot of free maintenance because they want you to bring it back so they maintain that relationship. Because they understood in the past, sometimes those relationships would undermine future purchases. So this really ends this session. 
which is on market principle three, all competitors react, so I have to manage SCA. A couple things we took out of it. One that's important is that these are important assets that you spend years to build, and the way we track them is through the, the Bohr equity grid or stack, um, the equity perspective where we stack the three together in the beer example, where we have value equity, brand equity, and relationship equity. Those together is a way we measure how, how strong our sustainable competitive advantage is. And then we see coming out of this, we're going to have a, a Bohr grid, Bohr strategy grid, and that's going to tell us what we want to achieve with brand offering relationships. The next three sessions, one on brands, one on offering, and one on relationship, is going to tell us now how to execute it, how to implement these strategies once we know what we want to achieve. Well, thank you. Until next time.